I'm a huge believer in being able to be dangerous in a lot of things as a lawyer, particularly you're trying to be a general counsel. What does it mean to be a deal maker? Does it mean representing your company in transformational M&A transactions? Is it about building and selling your own business? Helping your company sell to one of the largest professional services firms in the world? Driving an IPO process for the business? Today, I'm here with Renee Paula, the SVP of Business and Legal Affairs at Vaccinity, and he has done all of these things. Among other topics, we're going to chat today about if he considers himself to be a dealmaker, an operator, a lawyer, or all of those things, and more. Renee, thanks for joining this episode of The Abstract. Thanks for having me. I didn't realize that I was just showing up to your conference, you're going to corner me and make me do this. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, we have a studio, we've got a great crew, it would be fun to do one of these episodes live, uh, and I couldn't think of a more dynamic person to, to do it with. Thank you. Before we get into some of your career and some of those transactions that I was talking about, what's top of mind for you right now? Wow. I mean, I would just say I'm glad the year's coming to an end, right? It's been <laughs> pretty brutal, pretty tough. When you think about the war in Ukraine and Silicon Valley Bank going under and, you know, the economy and so many things. Now Israel's conflict, it's just, it's been a very tough year having to deal with many different things that keep coming out of left field, even though they're not quite related to your business. Mm-hmm that uh, I am somewhat looking forward to putting this one behind us, grab some eggnog during the holidays, and um, yeah, move on. But it's been an interesting year. Do you like your eggnog with a little bit of nutmeg on top I'm or sure not? <laughs> you gotta go, you know, dress it up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it actually, it has been a tough year for a lot of people personally, and some of that bleeds over into the professional sort of sphere uh, as well. And You've had to be a leader through all of that uh, at Vaccinity, helping other colleagues through some of these sort of fire drills. I want to go back to the beginning of your career to start with and, and talk a little bit about the experiences that shaped you and put you in a position to be that sort of leader. Uh-oh. Is this, is this a therapy session? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is neither coaching nor therapy. Uh, <laughs> And I certainly, uh, you know, there won't be a fee at the end of the, the conversation either. You were pretty business-minded from the start. You were a CPA, actually, before you went to law school. And then you had a tenure at Cravath, which I think is a very business-minded law firm. I actually don't usually ask guests on these episodes about their time at the law firm. We focus more on sort of when they're in businesses. But Cravath has a very interesting rotational model. Can you tell us a bit about your early days at the firm and, and how that shaped you as a lawyer and as a business person? Sure. Well, it's going back a while. Um, but I would say Kravath, it, it's still unique in that it con- continuously rotate you every 12 to 18 months through a different area of practice, right? Mm-hmm. So during my time there, I was there seven years. I did a lot of M&A, a lot of capital markets. I did some fund formation because you constantly switch uh, among groups of about nine or 10 lawyers that are working on particular types of transactions. And so I think it was very good in terms of being able to see many different types of things, right? Mm-hmm. And many different types of transactions across different types of industries. Because I think there's a difference between being a junior lawyer and then leaving, where you got to do some of the work, you got to try and how to draft, but you're not quite leading, let's say, uh, versus when you're like a mid-level or senior lawyer, where you're actually leading others, right, in terms mm-hmm. of how to drive a transaction, then eventually actually getting into a boardroom and actually truly acting like, as a partner. Uh, but then also, again, beyond that, just by spending the time working across so many industries, you start getting familiar with all the different business models, all the different issues that come up mm-hmm. in different types of sectors. So I think that was just a great experience before I eventually uh, left right after the financial crisis. And, and you went to HSBC. I can't think of a better firm to prepare you for a role in financial services. That's kind of an interesting time also to be joining a big financial services firm. You worked on some major transactions there. Tell us, tell us about your time in financial services. So it was, it was yeah. the absolute worst time. Right? So <laughs> it, it's funny because I imagine it's super tough to, for this to happen today. But I actually went to HSBC by just applying online. right? Like yeah. Literally submitted my resume with not a client. Um, of the firm and, and I got the job, but I specifically went there because unlike some of the bigger banks in the U.S., 
Mm-hmm. Um, it was small enough that I was going to be a quote unquote generalist, right? So I was actually going to cover five different desks and do multiple things. But just after I joined, they decided to actually pull out of the US. So um, oh, wow. my job was not going to be an MA lawyer at SBC, but I ended up doing the principal transactions for SBC because no one else had more MA experience. And honestly, I was just a junior guy that just showed up. I ended up selling the credit card business, selling a whole bunch of bank branches. Um, there used to be hundreds. Now there's literally like a handful in New York City. Offloading the private equity group because of Dutch Frank's relation. So I just went through a lot of transactions for HSBC itself, which is also an incredible experience, but it was also very depressing, right? Like I would close the deal on Friday, show up on Monday, and like five floors in the building would be empty because everybody was told not to. It was a reduction almost, yes. right? Like a pulling out of the US as opposed to correct, correct. Uh, yeah, anything correct. growth oriented. Correct. Huh. It was pulling out of the US. And so. Incredible experience, again, doing like credit card deals, insurance deals, private equity deals, uh, selling actual physical bank branches. Um, so again, super interesting from a career perspective and getting to learn a lot about different types of industries. Uh, but it was a very, very tough job mentally because, again, it was, you know, tens of thousands of jobs were cut. I didn't know the story. Uh, so, you know, the next question I had for you was, how did you know it was time to leave financial services and move into tech and move into Audible? And that's a little more apparent. Now yeah, that yeah. <laughs> so it was we just, had the background. Yeah, it was so brutal. Um, again, just kind of from like what we now call mental health perspective at the time, I didn't know what to call it, right? But it was depressing. Mm-hmm. And um, I somewhat got lucky, right? Like I saw that Amazon had acquired Audible.com. I had done a transaction for Audible uh, years before, because Audible had been a very small public company. Mm-hmm. Um, and Amazon acquired it. And then for the first time, they were going to put in a team. Um, I was the first lawyer that worked at Amazon, not in Seattle. Uh, so wow. that in and of itself was a, a big thing. And I had to like fly back and forth to Seattle every other week for four months. because I wanted to make sure I understood the culture and drank the Kool-Aid. And so... Yeah, it was just, it happened to be at the perfect time in terms of like, they needed someone. I knew the in-house team, the internal management team. And then I also actually happened to know some of the folks at Amazon that were recruiting because they had been cravat lawyers that left early on to Amazon when it was still a young company and still only like 30, 40 lawyers. Obviously today, Amazon is one of the biggest law firms in the sure. world. And so I just, I hopped in and started rebuilding the team because when the acquisition happened, a lot of the folks just left and cashed out. So it was kind of start again. So I was like the first lawyer at Audible to build a team, et cetera, et cetera. Was that a scary time for you at all? I mean, leaving financial services behind, moving, did you think the rest of my career is going to be in tech? Because uh, financial services, even if it wasn't so fun, is comfortable and yes. stable. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so, I mean, just I was excited about the opportunity and the challenge and just doing something different. Amazon was on fire, right? So, yeah. of course, I was like trying to join the rocket ship. Sure. You know, I, I didn't know where my career was going to go, um, but it was truly an incredible opportunity. And, and it turned out that way, right? I mean, I worked through lots and lots of growth from, like, you know, opening multiple offices in multiple countries and going into multiple languages, right? Like, it was like audiobooks mm-hmm. um, that we started launching in, like, German and French and Spanish. And, you know, um, so doing a lot of deals across, um, content with publishers, which sure. you know, is an oligopoly. It's only a handful of publishers that control most of the content, book content in the world. So that was you know, super interesting. But also I did things that I never thought I would, right? I'm now negotiated with labor unions because it is right. actors that actually like read the book. So it was actually quite an interesting, I guess, role to call it that. Um, because most people don't think about listening to an audio and like, you know, major antitrust issues because we basically had a monopoly in audiobooks at the mm-hmm. time. And again, labor unions going to strike and wanting more money to sit down and read a book for a couple hours. So there's all these random things that you never thought would come up. And then it was what I'll call the beginning of digital marketing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now it's all very well understood, but you know, the iPhone came out in 07. So really 2010, 2011, people started figuring out how to do mobile marketing. Yeah. And of course, Audible... And audiobooks are all about you listening while you're driving or doing something else in the subway, commuting. Um, so all the privacy issues and then just mm-hmm. like the actual attribution to figure out who to pay because they were the affiliate that brought you that customer. All of this was actually getting set up in those kind of 29, 
2009, 2010, you know, 2011, 12, like years. So it was just super interesting to be going through that process. That's really interesting. And Amazon now is a big player in ads themselves. Yes. Um, yes. I'm sure you saw the very sort of like beginnings of that, the kernels that, you know, lead to the, the huge Amazon ads business that exists today. Yeah. yeah. And so many things, again, it's, it's amazing now everything's taken for granted. But <clears throat> for example, AI and then like Siri and voice, like, yeah. I mean, we were at the beginning of that, right? Like we created this product called uh, Whisper Sync for Voice, which was actually matching up what you could read on a Kindle device, right? The actual words with the basically the transcript that you see live happening on a zoom call today right but we somewhat invented a lot of that by matching up the audio from a person reading the book to the kindle device and so like for children and people learning a language you see the bouncing ball like karaoke like listening to the actual yeah. audiobook and the bouncing ball in the kindle book which was super difficult at the time right mm-hmm. and groundbreaking and then again now you go on youtube like every video has an automatic transcript. So yeah. uh, it was a lot of cool stuff. Um, and again, t- today it's just like normal. Yeah, like really cool from a technical perspective, yeah. actually. Um, your next role in tech was one of founder. Uh, pretty unusual. I actually don't know if I've had anybody on an episode of The Abstract yet who's been a like a full founder themselves of a, I'm going to say, not a consulting business, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, a, a business, especially with like a hardware product. Uh, tell us a little bit about the company at Sonar, uh, and you know, uh, how you came up with the idea, like go, getting into hardware seems super challenging. It's, it's very masochistic. <laughs> I mean, I do not recommend it for anybody, <laughs> <laughs> but so this is one of those things where you say there's gotta be a better way. Right. So the product was a baby monitor uh-huh. and you say every parent thinks about, you know, stuff for their kids. Um, but at the time, the Apple Watch did not, did not exist, right? Wearables mm-hmm. were not a thing quite just yet. And the big idea was that every baby monitor, however fancy there is, and cameras and temperature and humidity control, right. uh, you know, it's about the sound, right? When the baby cries, the speaker mm-hmm. goes off. So then both of you parents probably, uh, or, you know, single, sorry, you know, but, you know, the parents will wake up. Okay? Sure. Particular situation where you have two parents sleeping in a bed, um, I, for example, could not fall asleep easily. So if I'm woken up by a baby crying, um, whether or not I'm going to want to go like feed the baby or change the baby, um, it'll take me like an hour to fall asleep again. Great. So it's like, there has to be a better way. So the big idea was add a wristband Mm -hmm. to the baby monitor operations such that the wristband would vibrate. Then you can either both wear a wristband and take turns or only one will wear it. And throughout the night, Mm -hmm. each time the baby cried, it would wake you up through vibration and then you go take care of the baby, but the other person actually gets to sleep because they never hear the speaker and the baby crying. So the pat- I got patents around all the fail safes of like, well, what happens if like it vibrates, but you don't wake up. So you got to take care of the baby. So it's like all this different method to make sure that you would definitely wake up. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so get patented. And therefore once I was like, Oh, this, this could work, right? Yeah. That patent would protect against, like, you know, the Apple Watch and everybody came after it uh, would actually be covered by this patent in terms of, like, if you're using it for purposes of, like, all the fail of what you have to do to make sure that someone would eventually wake up sure. and maybe cries, um, I should go for this. And so I hired a mechanical engineer, a uh, product designer, and, you know, created prototypes. But it's a very difficult business in terms of you need to put massive amounts of capital. And at the time, my thinking was, I'm still going to go back. To, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so eventually, I got the opportunity to sell to another company in the Bay Monitor business mm-hmm. because they loved the concept and the patents. Mm-hmm. And so it was really about selling the patents and the technology more than an operating business. Like I never actually did a production run, um, mm-hmm. but it was I think it was very instructive in learning all the emotions that go through that, right? In terms of like actually launching something from scratch. Mm-hmm. and all the pains that goes with it. You're a lawyer, uh, but you're not an IP lawyer. Was getting the patents an easy process? Uh, did you teach yourself a lot of sort of at least IP law process? Yeah. Uh, so, so no, I mean, I'm a huge believer in being able to be dangerous in a lot of things as a lawyer, particularly you're trying to be a general counsel. Yeah. Um, but that's one area that I've never tried to play you know, as if I know what I'm doing. So I hired patent lawyers to do this. Yeah. Even today throughout my career, I do a lot of, you know, labor deployment and, you know, mm-hmm. taxes and, you know, obviously corporate and like litigation. The moment you touch patents, I'm like, <laughs> I need to go get a patent lawyer. Find an expert. Yeah. <laughs> 
you'd done a lot of different transactions before for big companies, was doing the transaction yourself for a business that you had incubated and created, uh, was that different in a meaningful way? Oh, for sure. And I think, again, it changed how I think about transactions, right? Having been on that actual other side of a founder or an owner selling Mm -hmm. and going through all the emotions, I can truly now relate to what they're going through in their mind, selling their baby and like all the different things that they care about that may seem irrelevant almost Mm -hmm. because they're coming out of an emotional state of mind rather than a logical or rational state of mind. Uh, And I think that's made me a much better deal maker, right? Um, but going through that, for example, I mean, I ended up selling it all for equity, right? Because mm. I was like, you know what, this is already a risk. I'm going to take the big risk here. Like, I'm going to yeah. take a chunk of this other company. And so I'm going to pay off massively or it won't. And to make the story short, the sad part is that the company actually just filed for bankruptcy oh. literally a couple of months ago. So it went on for like five, you know, six, seven years. And then the, again, kind of so difficult fundraising environment. They had a, a product recall. Uh, with bad firmware, it's the hard part about uh, hardware because uh-huh. it's lots of software engineers. But if there's something that goes wrong at a chip level, like your toast, right? You manufactured, mm-hmm. you know, hundreds right. or thousands of units, and uh, they had a recall. I, you know, I did them under. But yeah, I think going through that experience, and I negotiated for myself. I did the deal myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I think made me learn a lot about how founders think, how they go through a transaction. Did you ever say or utter the phrase, it was selling my baby, and then say, no pun intended? <laughs> That's a really bad joke, but. <laughs> not quite. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to breeze a little bit past your, your next sort of role at Anheuser-Busch IBV, which is, as most people know, uh, if not the world's largest brewer, yes. it is the world's largest brewer, um, because I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about a couple transactions you did as a part of Bionic and Vaccinity. You know, the role at Anheuser-Busch was in the ventures division. So working on a lot of their innovation projects, um, doing some investments. How did that lead you ultimately to Bionic? So what happened was um, Six six Ventures was created at AB InBev as the kind of skunk works or growth division because um, the company was massive, which is not growing, right? And so Mm -hmm. the idea was how do we re-inject some sort of DNA um, and we were, I was literally 23 or 24, I'm playing 23 or 24 out of WeWork. Um, and we were given free reign to go, you know, break things and make things happen quickly. And so we made a lot of programmatic investments from a venture capital perspective mm-hmm. in pursuit of m and So, you know, I did something like 45 VC investments wow. and we bought like 17, 18 companies. So we would only invest wow. in a company that we thought... We had some particular skill uh, to help a distribution or use the product and become a kingmaker, right? Like just by my investing and then using that product and make it very big. Mm-hmm. And that model worked out so well because I think we did a few things, right? In terms of like incentivizing people, like how do you bring out the economic animal on a particular employee instead of big enterprise, right? Like we have a big mm-hmm. enterprise, you get a decent check. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to get a paycheck on Friday. So you need to bring that back, that certain level of uncertainty and like risk that make people want to work hard. Mm-hmm. And so we created a number of different things about how all these like growth divisions usually worked in enterprises. Uh, that it worked so well that, you know, Harvard Business School wrote a case study or, or Stanford, I forget, but like one of the biggest yeah. business schools wrote a case study and then it became a thing. And so this... Consultant Business Bionic, we had engaged them at the very beginning when it was just a few people out of WeWork to think about like, how can we change the big enterprise? Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> it worked out well, right? So as it happened, the CEO came back and said, well, you guys crushed it. And mm-hmm. you know, there's now business case studies about this. Like, why don't you join me and let's go sell this to other big enterprises? And that was an opportunity to kind of, you know, quote unquote, switch out of legal for real. Um, yeah. That was not going to be a legal role. And I said, sure, it sounds interesting. Let's do this. And so we went to um, sell this model of like how to actually grow um, by having a small team that slowly takes over the company, like, you know, injecting it, infecting it like a virus. And, uh, and it worked very well. We, you know, we work with like Nike and P&G and all, like, all these great companies to the point that eventually, yeah, we went to sell it to Accenture because Accenture, obviously massive consulting organization, but they were missing the angle that we did and how we did 
consulting. But as you said, at Bionic, your full-time role covered much more than just legal. There was finance, there was ops, you were in market There's actually like, selling services. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, do you feel like your time as a founder prepared you particularly well for that? Were there other experiences? Were you really excited to sort of go beyond the legal remit and be a true operator? T- tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, look, I had worked at Deloitte before going to law school. So right. perhaps like doing a little bit of the actual consulting and client service delivery. I mean, I was somewhat comfortable with that, but I had been out of college, right? For a yeah. junior person. I would say having been quite a senior lawyer um, at Cravath, where you actually get to sit in the wardrobe and have conversations with like, you know, chiefs um it was probably more important because Mm -hmm. in this type of consultant work you have to sell the dream and the strategy and how is it that we're going to actually make a big impact in your massive organization right because growing two percent for you know apple this is has to be super difficult it's just so big right and so um i think that kind of selling aspect probably was super helpful to have been a founder and have to sell my idea over mm-hmm. and over to people to like get the engineers and even get a company to build your prototype. Like everybody's like saying, like, we have so many opportunities. Why would I pick up your yeah. idea to help you with it? Right. Um, so the constant selling and then be able to truly bring down the strategy to like a few sentences and explain it extremely well with like extremely senior people. I think that's what was super helpful. Um, but then otherwise the rest is about just, you know, what I tell my kids, you have to be super comfortable with many languages, right? I'm not just talking about speaking languages, right? Like, yes, I speak Spanish and my kids now speak English, Spanish and like they're learning Mandarin. Um, good for them. But uh, it's about like, you have to be extremely good at math and finance and accounting. You have yeah. to be able to, you know, code if you can, right? Like, and so like some of the things that happened within my time at Bionic was simply that as I spent time there and came in, I was like, wait a second. I'm not sure these numbers work, right? So I started digging into it and our unit economics were not working. Mm-hmm. And so as part of the management team, I started pounding the table, like our numbers are incorrect. So I ended up taking over the finance team, right? And then, <laughs> then you start thinking about like actual deploying people, a consultant business. I'm like, wait a second, like we are assigning people like incorrectly. Like this is not the way it should be done. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing you know, I ended up taking over operations. And so like, being able to question things because you are dangerous enough in these other quote unquote languages, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's what made me successful at Bionic. As we, as we went to sell the company, um, I was able to then also articulate to Accenture again what was the secret sauce that we had because there's a lot of consultants of business out there, right? Sure, uh, that would made it worthwhile for them. Let's talk a little bit about that sale to Accenture. Uh, selling a professional services business. To a professional services business is pretty hard uh, and doesn't happen all that often. Can you tell us about how that sale came about and how you were able to help close that deal? Yeah. So um, those sales are very different. Um, again, it's almost like selling a law firm to a law firm, right? Uh, yeah. or, or merging two law firms. Because it's about, um, you know, for a professional services firm to grow, there are challenges around the economies of scale. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like each time you have to go open a new office, significant expense, even though you're quite not sure where you're going to have the volume of work you need to fill it. But then if you get a small office, you fill it in two seconds and then you're stuck again. Right. So there's a constant like step layers of like each time you go to the next level, it's just very expensive and mm-hmm. scary. And so for us, um, we had gone through a growth period and the founders have been around for a little while that it's just like, it would be much better if you merge with somebody else or sell somebody else. And so I think Accenture definitely understood that and appreciated that. So they were open to, you know, we need to, you know, we're willing to buy companies like this. And so we went through a process, right? So I actually engaged an investment bank to help us sell the company to market it out. Uh And we marketed it to, you know, 100 professional services firms. Uh, But it was super interesting because unlike any other business, what you're selling is actually the people, right? Yeah. Meaning we literally put profiles on every single consultant and they flip pages and think about whether or not these people will be marketable because mm-hmm. the reality is, well, you have a lot of engagements with clients. Um, those engagements are completely, uh, uh, constantly turning over, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and there's relationships. They're relationship uh, driven. They're yeah. 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 are with the particular yeah. individuals. Yeah. And so if a big professional services firm hire, you know, buys a smaller consultant firm and all the consultants quit, then they didn't actually buy anything, right? So 
the transactions are structured a lot as like significant backend earnouts. Mm-hmm. And so you have to both motivate the team and convince the team that it's going to be okay yeah. that, you know, we're going to change, you know, ownership, but we're going to try to keep our culture and keep doing our job and focus on what we need to do uh, and keep building and keep the relationships yeah. so that eventually we all get paid in the back end. It was just so different and so interesting. Uh, but we went through the process and it worked very well, right? I mean, eventually you get absorbed. So Bionic, I mean, I left, but Bionic survived its own brand for a while. And then now mm-hmm. just recently it got absorbed into a future shop. How did you know that it was time for you to go back to doing a legal mix of legal and other sort of operations roles, but at a company as opposed to sort of staying on as a consultant and maybe growing within Accenture? And Yeah, so I mean, every job I've had has always been that someone that knows me well reaches out and says, hey, yeah. can you come help me with this? Um, so here, as we were going through the sales process and understanding what life would be like after the fact, right? I mean, I was going to have a $7 million target for sales mm-hmm. as a managing director, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, this is interesting. I mean, I've done sales before, but $7 million sounds like a lot. <laughs> and then I get a call saying, hey, well, actually, I didn't get a call. I ran into someone at a conference. Yeah. I'm a CEO. We were both kind of speaking at a conference for different reasons. And she said, I'm going to take my company public. I'm like, oh, ha, ha, ha. Like, you know, everybody's going <laughs> You public. and everyone else, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody's going public through a SPAC. It's like, yeah, I have a SPAC, but it's all signed up. And I'm like, sure. No, she showed me, like, it's signed up. It's like, come help me take the company public. And I was like, okay, I've never taken the company public, a company public from the inside, right? I've done a lot of IPOs and transactions as a lawyer um, firm, but not inside. So I was like, this could be interesting. Yeah. So... Uh, it was really about checking that box, right? Mm-hmm. I have or had no experience in life sciences or biotech, but it is all about regulatory work, right? I've done a lot of mm-hmm. alcoholic beverage regulatory work. Um, I have done a lot of transactions. So they were open to like, you're going to come and help us do this deal and then build a legal team and process and all that. And so uh, it was just coincidence and perfect timing as it relates to like, I get to sell Bionic and... Within six months, say vaccinated public, it was it was quite a ride. That is fast. Well, by the time, <laughs> well, you have no idea because the spec fell off, fell apart. It was a traditional so, IPO, so it's a tra- right? Traditional IPO. Yeah. So I actually started basically working two jobs because by the time it became evident that we we're going to sell and we signed, we, we took a long time to close Bionic. Mm-hmm. So I actually joined vaccinity with everybody's understanding and acknowledgement. So like Center New, Bionic New, right. Vaccinity New. And I basically ran two jobs for like, you know, uh, three months or, or four months, like, like second quarter of 21 was absolutely insane for me. Sounds um, brutal. And then uh, as we started preparing for the IPO, that's why yeah. if you look at my LinkedIn, it looks like, you know, I did the IPO in three months, not it took like six, seven months. Uh-huh. Um, but I was basically doing both jobs. Tell us about the IPO process itself. Uh, how was it different being on the inside? You said you worked with bankers before, so maybe that wasn't surprising to you. But, but tell us, you know, what was unexpected about running a, a traditional IPO process? Being a lawyer at a firm or having a working financial services, you get to see um, all these PPMs, right? Private placement memorandums, or you see the you know, prospectuses for deals. But even when you come in to work in those, there's something written there already. You're kind of editing and adding to it and, mm-hmm. you know, drafting and modifying. We had to actually write this thing from scratch, right? So like when you start with a blank piece of paper to say, I'm going to draft now yeah. a prospectus for an IPO. I mean, that was mind boggling. Um, <laughs> then again, in 21, lots of companies went public quickly, given the opportunity. And I think we took advantage of that, but it took a lot of effort to just be able to put together all the information to you know build the prospectus and then all the systems financially to be able to operate as a public company and at the time we d- did not have a cfo and the accounting team was uh great accounting folks financial folks but they had never actually really worked at public companies uh, and in fact like our head of our finance lived in ireland right he was not a us based you know financial or accounting hmm. person uh-huh. so um, I very much acted as the CFO in terms of having to build the book, not just the words from the legal side, but the actual numbers, P&Ls, financials, 
um, summary tables. And then there's so many, so many numbers for <laughs> prospectus <laughs> and the MDNA and all that. Um, and he was, he was brutal, right? So it's just like very little sleep, but having to put together this thing from scratch, you know, 300 pages explaining your business. Not only do you have to learn your business extremely well, if you didn't already know it, right? Because I had just so much shown up. So I had to like learn the business to be able to truly help <clears throat> create the narrative. And then both from a financial perspective and then protect yourself as a lawyer with the mm -hmm. risk factors and the legal perspective. And it's very different. I think, again, it made me think about how when I was a law firm lawyer, I almost, it's going to sound bad, but I thought poorly of in-house lawyers, right? Because it's like, they're not detail-oriented. Like, haha, they missed this, like, drafting mistake. <laughs> um, I'm so much better than them. And then you're inside um, running at 100 miles an hour, realizing how difficult everything is. And it's like, only the things that truly matter is what you can spend your time on. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, this thing truly mattered. Uh, but... I can tell you during that time, there's so many things that we were just like doing the absolute minimum, right? So like, if I go back and look at some of the contracts that we got done during the time, I'm like, man, I could have done this better. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, look, it's going well. You're not personally great. going to be proofreading, <laughs> right? Like, every, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Wow. Uh, that was not exactly how I expected those two things to overlap. And I don't think I've ever heard of anyone who's run two transactions at once, one of which is an IPO that you're doing from both the finance and the legal perspective. That That's a pretty incredible six yeah. month. I mean, the, and the sale, months you yeah, the sale to Accenture was from a CFO perspective, right? That was sort of purely a financial side. I mean, the actual contracts, legal documentation for that transaction were actually relatively straightforward. It was all about um, the numbers, the team, the you know, coming up with valuation and, mm -hmm. and then earn out structure. Um, but yeah, I didn't actually run the legal documents for that transaction, right? Like they have a big team of people. Sure. And then you kind of comment back and, and negotiate a little bit, but they, they run with the documentation. Well, not to pump you up too much. It's still pretty impressive. <laughs> a last sort of question for you on vaccinity before I've got a couple of fun, fun questions. You've really positioned yourself. And I think on the on the tail of a lot of other operating experience, but as an operator, right? Someone who's helping manage finance, people, IT, et cetera. I think there's a lot of GCs out there who are interested in growing their remit and expanding into some of those areas. Do you have a, one, I guess, a view on whether or not that's a wise idea for everyone, uh, but, but two, advice for those who are really committed to and really do want to do that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I've ended up in those situations simply because I'm super curious and I'm always yeah. questioning things, right? So I think, first of all, from a behavioral personality perspective, you have to be the type of person that is willing and wants to speak up above and beyond your remit of legal, right? And, and that is, you know, something in which people are very opinionated, right? Because I've sat at conferences just even recently where two people that I would say I, I respect actually said during a governance you know, conversation that, you know, at a board meeting, they try not to, you know, speak too much. They just mostly give legal advice. Hmm. Whereas and I almost fell off my chair because <laughs> I speak all the time at a board meeting and rarely ever we discuss legal points and I'm just participating from the business side, right? Now, again, I think I'm self-aware. I'm not like trying to hug the mic or anything that but like just sure. i'm like we are just management team like we are leaders of the company mm -hmm. so i don't wait for a legal issue or a risk situation to raise my hand and speak um so i, I think people have by forget a view about this i definitely don't think it's for everybody um there is all kinds of challenges right in terms of you know privilege conflicts and all those other things that you can think about but also for the most part you don't get paid a lot more, right? So yeah. if you're taking two hats, it doesn't mean you get paid double. Right. So you have double the responsibility, double the work, probably double the size of your team. And depending mm -hmm. how, you know, you be as a manager, right? Like I have one-on-ones with all my directs and like one-on-ones with my skip levels. Like, so you end up mm -hmm. having all this like work in developing the careers of all these different team members, right? You're not getting paid for it. So right. you have to just enjoy it, like it, uh, be a masochist, <laughs> be driven by adrenaline. Um, but again, it's not necessarily 
amazing and or for everybody. Yeah. Not as glamorous as it, it may seem from the LinkedIn profile. Yeah, it, it's definitely not. Yeah. And and oftentimes, again, you're now splitting your time. So depending on whether or not you have the resources to make your team, it would be okay. But if, you know, in lean times like now that you're not really hiring a lot of people, you may have even had to have reductions for us, sure. it's just a lot more work. So again, I think I find it very fulfilling and gratifying. I, just, I love being involved in many parts of the business. I just jump on loose balls, which is how I end up with you know, situations like this. Like so somebody leaves. <laughs> well, like somebody leaves. Like, you know, head of HR leave, left. It's like, okay, we're going to hire somebody else. Like maybe we can save the money. And Renee, take it over. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're willing to do it, it goes back to what I was saying. Like you got to learn multiple languages, right? Like mm-hmm. I think I happen to be having a background in finance and accounting, but I think it can all be learned. Like you know, yeah. take a couple of classes, like just one class of financial analysis. So that you can actually ask real questions and and you know challenge your finance team, right? And and like make them improve. But and then beyond that, whether you're in product, like truly understand how the product is built, whatever the product is, right? So whether it's kind of like software engineering or other types of engineering, whatever, right? And then I've always thought of myself in terms of like superpowers, more about it's the people, right? Like the hiring, the recruiting, yeah. the motivating. Like my proudest moments are not about like deals, it's about like People I've hired over time and are now all like general counsel of different companies. Um, and I may have been like the one that gave the first shot. And yeah. They grew it, right? It's like, how do you help people? And so depending on what you're good at speaking languages are, are your superpowers is mm-hmm. how you need to decide whether to truly go for it. Because otherwise, again, it's a double-edged sword. Like sometimes, you know, in my career, I've loved my career. I wouldn't change it. But it's not easy in terms of like, I don't fit any particular career path or box, sure. right? So that people look at me and say, are you even really a lawyer? Do you want to be a lawyer? I'm yeah. like, yeah, I want to be a lawyer. I just don't want to be stuck in a box that I can only talk about legal issues. Yes. They're like, oh, but you've been in digital media and alcohol and like biotech, like yeah. actual pharmaceutical drugs. Like, I'm like, because I like the challenges that have been a cross pollinator. Like when you learn from so many different things, you can actually like, actually drive change that is beneficial by taking into account other things you have experienced. But not everybody sees it that way, right? Like yeah. I've talked to plenty of professionals, you know, recruiters in my life that call me and then when they understand my path, they're actually nervous. Like, no, oh, I'm just going to go get a guy that have done 10 straight deals in life sciences, right? Or yeah. 10 straight deals, you know, whatever the industry is. So you need to have your eyes wide open. Uh, this is not for everybody. And it, it sounds cool. I think it's super cool, yeah. but it may actually also make your career more difficult, right? Like I've never been recruited by a recruiter. Mm-hmm. I don't know at this point I ever will be. Mm-hmm. It is a an actual CEO or director, board director, or someone that either knows me or has heard about me and says, this guy is just officially masochistic <laughs> and, and smart enough. They can and curious. It out. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and curious. Figure it out. Yeah. Uh, just a few more questions for you. Um, What's a mistake that you've made uh, or you've seen others make that you think a lot of folks are headed for? I, I like this one because uh, I think it's helpful for folks in the audience to have someone like you who's seen a lot uh, tell them something that might be on their horizon. Well, I somewhat alluded to this already, so it might sound boring, but it's just not paying attention to the numbers. Like mm-hmm. wherever you are, whether you came from litigation background or corporate background or whatever, you just have to get into the weeds of the numbers. That's my perspective. Um, I just think that um, many companies today um, are suffering, even the economy and the fundraising environment. And if you simply accept um, the basic messaging coming out of, you know, even your finance team, your management team, even though you're part of the team, Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, getting into the weeds and questioning and doing your own basic analysis and saying, wait a second. Like, yeah. I mean, our burn, we're actually burning a lot more than you're saying, right? Because you're not taking this and that this into account. And of course, it doesn't mean you go and tell the company, the rest of the employee base, you have to motivate right. people. And we have to be fair, understand where the true risks are, right? I just, I've seen, you know, I've been through multiple situations in my career where we haven't known how we're going to make payroll, right? Mm-hmm. And you haven't lived until you don't know <laughs> how you're going to make payroll. And look, Silicon Valley Bank happened, right? Like we had yeah. all our money in Silicon Valley Bank too. So like multiple, but like, you know, as a founder and like smaller places. 
And um, you don't want to get there and find out last minute, right? Because it's too late. So if you're closer to the numbers and the true unit economics and the true business model, um, you can be such better advisor and counsel to the company. And so um, I always tell everybody, because I, I do hear it still today many times. I actually just had lunch yesterday with a founder whose company, this is like a multi-exit founder, mm-hmm. somewhat famous person. The company just folded. And when we were having lunch, he said, I always focus so much on the P&L and I never focus on the balance sheet and the balance sheet took me under, which is what I mm-hmm. was talking about. It's like debt that they had on the books became problematic and mm-hmm. they could not <clears throat> work, do a workaround on the, on the debt. And so instead of raising more capital just to keep paying this debt from a poor acquisition they had done in the past, mm-hmm. he chose to literally just fold the company. And so this is even a multi-exit person that truly understands finance yeah. and get you know <clears throat> blindsided by this one issue that was just lurking there with this piece of debt that blew up in their face. So um, again, just got to spend the time to learn enough about finance to be dangerous if you want to be a good counselor. That's really great advice. Uh, I hope I don't blindside you with this one. Uh, Renee is a really good dancer, uh, as I <laughs> learned at TechGC's uh, exec offsite in Hawaii last year. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what's your favorite dance move? I, I played the fifth. I don't know <laughs> okay, I'll give you a different favorite question. If you're not going to tell us your favorite dance move. I don't uh, know what they're called. That's dance, right? <laughs> uh, what's, a, what's a great book that you've read recently? So I just finished a book called uh, Cultish Hmm. by Amanda. I forget her name. Amanda something. We'll find it for the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's about how quote unquote normal people and smart people fall prey to what we generally throw around the word cults. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, it's because, you know, language and motivation and how you can have people focus on certain things and completely ignore other things. And she goes through so many different examples on our current environment from politics to like, it's like, how could somebody follow this politician who's crazy and lies and does bad things, but yeah. they just firmly follow them to, you know, Equinox and Cell Cycle. And like all these other companies that have developed this massive following mm-hmm. and it's just not luck. There's a whole science to it. And I was like blown away. I was like, oh my God. Like, you know, it's also bad because people could almost use it as a playbook now. Yeah. She just goes to the entire, like, what do you do? How do you create that click? And what language do you use to again, like start influencing people? And then how do you like create these crazy statements that people ignore them um anyway it's, it's just fascinating it's really fascinating highly that, recommend it that sounds super interesting i'm going to pick that up for uh one of my next flights yeah uh well renee thank you so much for being here and doing this episode with me live at the spot dress summit this has been a lot of fun for me uh well thanks for having me that hopefully it was good because hopefully hopefully <laughs> hopefully it was better than therapy <laughs> <laughs> you're so good yeah thanks for having me And uh, to our listeners, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Abstract, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe so you can get notified as soon as we post a new episode. And if you liked this one, I'd really love to hear your thoughts. So please leave a rating or a comment. If you'd like to reach out to me or our guest, our LinkedIn profiles are in the description. See you all next week.